Good morning, everyone, and welcome to yet another episode of Three Plastic Surgeons and a Microphone. I'm Sam Jajurikar, and as always, I am joined by my host, Dr. Sal Pacella at San Diego Plastic Surgeon, and Dr. Sam Marie at Brasmus, New Jersey, Brasmus, New Jersey at Bergen Cosmetic. Good morning, gentlemen. Hello. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. So uh, before we get into the meat of our uh, discussion today, first, we're going to have Dr. Ree, a little, little disclaimer, uh, just covering the legal basis. Yes, this show is not a substitute for professional medical advice, diagnosis, or treatment. The show is for informational purposes only. Treatments and results may vary based upon circumstances, situation, and medical judgment after appropriate discussion. Always seek the advice of your surgeon or other qualified health provider with any questions you may have regarding medical care and never disregard professional medical advice or delay seeking advice because of something in this show. Great, well, today we're gonna go on a little bit of a tangent. Uh, typically we talk about plastic surgery related issues, but uh, one of our uh, co-hosts has had a very interesting development in the last few months, which uh, actually caused our show to go on hiatus. Um, but instead of being the surgeon, Dr. Pacella was actually a patient and he went through total knee arthroplasty. And so we're really interested in learning about what he's been going through, what it's like for the surgeon to be a patient. So uh, with that, Dr. Pacella, let us know how the last few months have been. Well, thanks guys. Um, you know, so it's, uh, it's been an exciting time for me. Uh, you know, I've been out of work about two months and then a half time for about a month after that. And so I'm going on my fourth month right now after surgery, and it's it's been interesting to say the least. Um, I would say overall, it's been exceptionally positive experience. I was in a bit of pain prior to um, this uh, total knee replacement, um, and it was really affecting um, not only my work life, but my personal life as far as, you know, doing all the things I love to do. So. So really it was, I'm 49 years old and, and I was sort of pushing off this for a couple of years and, uh, you know, mentally I, I thought to myself, well, if I could just make it to 50 with this bad knee, you know, kind of, kind of go from there. But, you know, I just really had to, had to go and get it done. So, um, I've got a little PowerPoint here. I'd maybe want to share a little bit. So I'll kind of just dive in and kind of tell my story a little bit about how I, how I came about this here. So share okay so um i try to th i've heard this this quote probably 20 25 years ago and i i had a difficult time finding the actual origin of who said this but i think it really kind of resonates very well with me embrace every scar as a lesson learned and uh, i think not only for me personally but for our patients you know i i try to try to uh, sort of live and learn this and teach this to my patients because you know as we as we make choices in our life, um, those choices make you. And so this has really been a, this knee injury that I've had on my left knee uh, really is a direct result of choices that I've made uh, as a young man, continue to make as a, as a middle-aged. So, um, and this, this story first starts with, uh, with a, a sport that is well endeared to my heart. It's, it's the sport of rugby. And, you know, these are, these are a couple pictures of me throughout my years. I mean, down at the bottom here, you can kind of see this guy with long hair standing up. That's me in college. Uh, this uh, picture here up above is me in medical school. And then this is me residency towards the end at the University of Michigan. If you remember, if you look at the space right here, the guy hiding underneath here, that's a, a former guest host on our show, Dr. Trussler. And, you know, I, I grew up um, playing football in high school and kind of transitioned to rugby in undergrad just because I didn't play college football. And it, it's a, it's kind of a sport that has really, I think, been a very important part of my life. Um, you know, as I couldn't play anymore after several injuries, um, my first injury was when I was 19. I tore my ACL and then I've had about five or six other surgeries, including another ACL on the same knee. And then, um, you know, multiple cartilage injuries. So it's really just my left knee that has been affected. My right knee is, right knee is totally fine. And as I stopped playing um, from my last injury, I sort of transitioned into kind of a little bit different role in the sport. I, I started to become a referee. I've done a lot of college matches and sort of semi-pro matches throughout the years. And then, of course, I started coaching 
when I couldn't referee anymore because of my knee. So um, these are my kids on the side. We, uh, just a couple of years ago, we won the Southern California Cup for their under 18. So it's been an important part of my life. And these are just some of the organizations um, that I've been involved with throughout the years, just various teams I've played with and various organizations that I've been involved with. And, you know, rugby in and of itself is not necessarily just a sport, but it's, it's really a community. And, you know, I, I've gained a lot of uh, friends and acquaintances and sort of a lot of philosophy of life just from being on the rugby field. And it's been an important part of my life that has been very difficult to give up. But those those scars, every scar is a lesson learned. And this is unfortunately what my left knee looked like prior to surgery. So you could see here that um, each of these screws and each of these scars tell a story. So this first um, uh, screw that's right in the femur here is from my first ACL reconstruction. That was a patellar tendon graft. Um, when I was in college, and that worked really, really well for a number of years. Very quick rehab after that. Um, you know, I went back to playing just about four or five months later, and it lasted. Uh, it lasted me for an additional ten to twelve years. Um, then, when I was a resident at the University of Michigan, my chief residency year, I tore my ACL again playing. And uh, the the folks at Michigan, the orthopedic surgeons, put me back together here, and that was. Uh, actually a total of three surgeries that I, uh, one of which was in a fellowship. And that involved this kind of long screw, a washer here, and another sort of insorb screw down below. And uh, that was a, the graft that they used to reconstruct ACL was the, the quad tendon, just an exceptionally painful, painful surgery. But the difference between these two surgeries, when I was 19, it was an massively easy recovery. Um, but when you're 35 going through something like this, it's a much different scenario. Plus adding in a few cartilage grafts or cartilage tears here, um, just exceptionally problematic. So uh, it, the thing that kind of really sort of made my decision was if you just look at the difference between my right leg and my left leg here, this right leg is unaffected. And if you look at the, the axis of uh, the bone here, if you look at this right side compared to the left side, you can see there's what we call a varus angle. So the angle of the bone is really off by about three degrees. And I, I never really noticed this until it really got too late. And uh, just, for, I, just for our listeners, when you say varus, are you meaning that you're basically bow-legged? Bow-legged, bow-legged, that's correct. That's absolutely right. And you know, one, one thing I, um, I didn't necessarily realize until several years ago as my, my surgeons were telling me, you know, when you're, when you're bow legged, like I am, it, it's very good for athletics. It's great for balance. It's great for speed and explosive, um, movement, but it's horrific once you sort of have your first, uh, meniscus injury. And most of the, most people, most athletes who are varus or have a varus deformity in their, in their bones. Um, are sort of predisposed to getting meniscal tears because if you look at how this, how the the physics of this is, is it's really grinding on the inner surface of the knee, and once that once that uh, meniscus is torn, the the setup of of the physics and the grind is just exceptional. So it's just once you have a first injury, in fact, some of the studies show that once you have your first ACL injury, regardless of whether or not you've had any cartilage injury, within 15 years you have demonstrated what's called arthrosis on your on your x-ray. Arthrosis is not arthritis. Arthritis is just simply an inflammation. And if you look at the, the x-ray, there may or may not be um, a change in the joint structure. Arthrosis is when there's actually a change, a visible change on the x-ray. And if you look here at my x-ray on the left side here, you can see these kind of out, um, these little bony outgrowths here. So this is just extensive, not only arthritis, but arthrosis, actual joint changes. So I, I do hope that most of our viewers out here and our two surgeons on the podcast here don't ever see this in their own x-rays. So <laughs> well, I was going to say, even, even though we're contrasting your right from your left, you do have uh, some changes on your right side too. Yeah, some flies. <laughs> yeah you've you yeah. got some arthritis on the, uh, and some arthrosis on the right side too. Yeah, but that's not as bad. <laughs> No. But, you know, the right one doesn't hurt. So, all right. So, so this was me, the morning of surgery. This was at the March 9th of this year. So here's me with, uh, as a patient, 
you can see the exceptionally happy look on my face here. <laughs> and this is the scar that uh, I actually already had a big, massive scar here. So it's, uh, you know, not, I necessarily don't care how the scar looks, but they just went through the same incision. So uh, Sal, let me ask you real quick, yeah. how hard was it for you to get to this point where you're sitting in the OR? Like, I know you waited a really yeah. long time. What, what finally drove you to, to decide I need to have the surgery? I, I can't, I can't not live without the surgery at this point. Um, so it, it was really, a, you know, so it's interesting. The, you know, my, my orthopedic surgeon, Bill Bugby said, you know, when you, and, and this is what every single orthopod I've known throughout my life told me was you, when, when you make the decision, you'll know it's the right time. And I, I thought to myself, you know, that's just ridiculous. That doesn't make any sense. There's gotta be some objective criteria to tell you when to do this, but, but he was 100% right. You know, and, and things such as, you know, parking, you know, you park in a park a lot and, you know, there's no spaces and you find yourself getting irritated because there's no spaces closer to the store or the facility you're going into. So you have to walk, uh, 30 yards. And it's like that, that, that process of walking just became annoying, you know, and just like puts you in a bad mood. Um, every single time I go outside to play basketball with my daughter or play Frisbee with my son, you know, it's like, oh my God, am I going to make a wrong step? And it's going to irritate me. You know, so, so just all the things I'd like to do in my life, referee and coaching, surfing became problematic. Surprisingly, I would say that surfing of anything, um, was the least affected, believe it or not, because with the exception of trying to stand up, which is, takes a lot of work, but you know, surfing is relatively low impact on your joints, but everything else, you know, I stopped running, I stopped hiking, I stopped mountain biking. Um, and it, and it just, it just became obvious that this needed to be done. Got it. Not, you don't have a typical nine to five job though. Was it hard to, you know, with all your patient care responsibility, you know, the fact that our jobs never really sort of end with, at the end, of the day, was it hard to, to, to carve out the time in your schedule? Yeah. So, patients respond to yeah, so, so good, good, uh, good question. So, um, you know, I, um, I wanted plenty of time to prepare my, my practice and my patients and, and my partners for this. So. I, I started the process about eight months in advance. So I, I made a decision somewhere around uh, the autumn of the year before, knowing that I was going to go out in March. And, um, you know, my, my two partners, Dr. Champanieri and Dr. Aria were just exceptional. You know, they said, whatever you need, get yourself healthy, et cetera. And, you know, um, my patients, I, uh, you know, I, I sort of told them I was going to be out on medical leave, you know. I would say a majority of them were very understanding. Some were not so understanding, but you know, the, the key here is if I'm not healthy, I can't make you healthy. So I think, you know, once, once I'm kind of up and moving around, that's the time for surgery, you know, and, and for me, you know, the act of standing in surgery was, was problematic. I mean, we do a lot of cases where we're standing. I thought myself, at least the facial cases, I would try to sit down a little bit more. Some of the breast cases, I, you know, at the end, once you're sewing, it's a more appropriate time to sit down um, or sit on a stool during surgery. But all, all of that just became much, much more challenging in my, in my uh, work life. Um, so, uh, okay, so this is uh, me the, the day of. This is also my, my team here. So uh, the gent on the right is Dr. Todd Austin, a very good and close friend of mine who did my anesthesia. Um, I was essentially pain-free. They did a block, something called an adductor block, which is uh, done right before surgery, a preoperative holding area. And then, um, you know, you're essentially pain-free for the entire time you're in the hospital. So it was just a great positive experience. Um, the gent on the right is uh, Bill Bugby, who is uh, my trusted orthopedic surgeon. I, I chose Bill uh, not only because he's got an outstanding reputation in the community, both in Southern California, but nationally, he, he tends to care for a lot of younger patients with cartilaginous injuries. Um, he's got an extensive lab where he does cartilage transplants and cartilage growth procedures uh, for young patients who have cartilage injuries. And by, by nature of his practice, he tends to do a lot of joint replacements on younger people like myself in their 40s or even 30s and a lot of ex-athletes. So he was, you know, it became pretty obvious he was, he was the choice. 
So, um, and Bill is just a master technician, just a, you know, exceptionally talented surgeon. So, uh, a couple pictures here. So, so they snap these photos, uh, during the surgery and for our viewers here, this is a, a slice open of my knee here and my knee sort of cracked open like a celery stalk here. So this is, oh, that is terrible. <laughs> yeah. So this that is, that is, that is awful. And yeah. that's awful. <laughs> <laughs> so, so just, uh, just to kind of go over what this looks like. So imagine your knee opened here. Okay. And what we're doing on the left side is we're looking at the undersurface, the joint surface of the fever, the big long bone in the leg. And normally the surface is very white and shiny. And what you can see here is there, the bone is very yellow, which means that bone should not be there. There should be a white surface there of cartilage, but you can see that kind of, that redness to the bone and the yellowness to the bone. That's what's called sclerotic bone. So that's when bone is injured to the point of losing some blood supply. Um, it looks very hard and thick and sclerotic and the, the whiteness on the, the white appearance on the outside is the remnant of cartilage. Okay. So like this, that rim of cartilage looks very abnormal, very diseased, very ground down. So this should normally be a very white cartilaginous surface that, that looks very shiny, like a chicken bone. And you can see here, it's, it's just kind of amorphous. It's granulated. It's. It's sort of irregular shaped and that's just a bad, bad disease. You know, I, I was running around and walking on this for many, many, many years and didn't, you know, obviously you can't tell that this looks the way it does. And, you know, it's, it's a surprise. My surgeon told me, you know, I, I can't believe you were in more pain from what you described. If you look at on the right side, that's called sclerotic bone is looking at the, the surface of the tibia. So that's the bottom bone of the leg. And that's it. That looks even worse, you know. So that's where the majority of the cartilage injury is, where the bucket hit, handle tears of the meniscus are. So that that's a really very badly uh, diseased surface. So he said about ninety six percent, ninety seven percent of the joint surface was was gone. Dude, that looks like stalks of cauliflower. That's amazingly bad. Holy man! Wow. I was I was gonna say cottage cheese, but I'm going in the same place. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, so, so, you know, it's funny as a, you know, as a plastic surgeon, when we work with orthopedic surgeons in the operating room, you know, we, we're often seeing the worst of the worst, right? Infected joints. Um, you know, we're oftentimes doing salvage procedures to salvage joint repairs. And, you know, we don't, we don't have a lot of understanding of routine orthopedic surgery like this, right? So, so I, you know, the, the last time I scrubbed in on a, on a joint replacement case was in medical school. You know, so, um, and same, you know, go ahead. Comments. No, go ahead. Oh, no, okay. I was just about um, to say same thing. Yeah. And so, um, you know, I just kind of, you know, we have this kind of joke with the orthopedic surgeons that they're, you know, they're just these kind of carpentry meathead kind of guys that, you know, they just go <laughs> and drill with saws and bow in, uh, and, and, um, drills. Right. Um, but it, it's, it's actually exceptionally precise. So. And it, and it has to be because if the, if the precision is not there, when you do the joint replacement, that joint replacement won't last very long. So what, so these on the left side are the cuts that are made to remove the joint surface. So this is all done, uh, with 3d mapping. So what they do is they put this jig on the femur and the tibia that has kind of a laser guided surface that tells the surgeon, um, in order to, to get the absolute mechanical central axis of the bone, you cut here. Okay. And so the surgeon is responsible for the cut, but it's all mapped out three dimensionally. And that, that was just fascinating for me to hear that, you know? Um, and then on the right side here is my new shiny, uh, joint. Um, the prosthesis that I have is, uh, something called a Zimmer persona. This, uh, is a, it comes in 12 different sizes. I had size number 11. Um, so, you know, I had some pretty big bones and big muscles, so it had to that surface that it's right. How, how, how disappointed were you? <laughs> 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 right. So, uh, so it's, so it's actually, the prosthesis comes in four parts. So it's a, 
So they first work on the femur and they put this cap on the femur. That's that shiny metal surface you're seeing here. Then they do the tibia, um, which is the bottom bone. And then in order to recreate the joint surface, there's a ceramic spacer that goes inside. So the, and it, it's all very precise the way they sort of calculate how big the spacer sh should be. So this spacer actually locks into the bottom surface on the tibial surface and essentially is your new joint space. So, the, so why this is important is if you ever need a revision surgery, uh, usually the part of the prosthesis, prosthesis that wears away is the central portion, the ceramic portion. And then the fourth part of the prosthesis is the inner surface of the kneecap. So that, um, that is shaved off and then that, that portion is resurfaced with another uh, ceramic type of prosthesis. So pretty, pretty interesting uh, view here. I think right, computer guided uh, cuts have uh, really revolutionized this, um, this joint replacement that it's really made it so much more precise, I feel like, and, and I'm really glad that these guys are using the most advanced technology for their joint replacements. It's, it's really fascinating. And you know, it really is, I just have so much respect for, for these, uh, these surgeons, both men and women. I mean, they are, you know, the precision is, is arguably much more precise than our job. I mean, when we, when we are doing plastic surgery, you think it's, you know, we're measuring things in millimeters, et cetera. And to some extent we do, but there's, there's inherently a lot of give and soft tissue. You can stretch things. You can get a feel for it. You don't have to be exceptionally precise with, you know, sewing in a muscle flap into a, into a wound, um, because you know, that tissue will grow, but bones are a much different story. The bones don't change. They don't stretch necessarily. And so it's, it's important for them to be exceptionally precise. Um, so this is, uh, this is me not in recovery, but in my room, uh, afterwards and a couple interesting comments here. So, um, after the surgery, check out that. Yes. So this is, this is actually at the, a view of the Torrey Pines golf course. And uh, what I want to say is, so this is on the fourth floor, four West of Scripps Green Hospital, which sits right on the bluff of Torrey Pines. And this is exactly the rooms that my breast cancer patients go to for post-operative recovery. So I was physically in the same room that I have been in for for over 12 years where my breast cancer patients go, really 419. So uh, it felt very special that they put me in a room uh, with such a great view here. And so um, so in recovery, I, I have absolutely no recollection of the recovery process. And um, it was funny, the other day I ran into a nurse I know, his name is Doug. And he asked me, I haven't seen him in a couple months. And he said, oh, how'd your surgery go? And I said, oh, really good. You know, I didn't feel anything in recovery. And he said, yeah, I heard, I heard you cried like a baby in recovery. <laughs> so, <laughs> I'm like, you're, you're absolutely right. You're probably right. <laughs> I, have, I have no recollection whatsoever. So the, the bigger they are and the harder they fall, right? And so this was actually a, a photograph that my wife took. Um, uh, in the room a few hours later. So the surgery was at 7.30 in the morning. I was in my room by about 9.45, and I was up walking by 11 a.m., believe it or not. You can see this walker in the background here. So um, now this is an interesting uh, picture here. So if you recall from um, from these uh, You're free on, oh, yeah. photos here, those are your yeah, these are, that's a screw and a post or the po a post, a screw and a washer. And so I was able to keep these here. Um, so I specifically asked for these and I don't know what I'm going to do with them. They're in an envelope in my, in my dresser drawer. And I, I think, you know, this is kind of an important thing for me to hold on to throughout my lifetime. Um, so I was happy that these were able to be salvaged. Um, so, so the interesting thing is the recovery, the, the post-operative recovery is very accelerated. So years ago, they used to keep you in bed for a week or two. Uh, they'd use this passive motion machine to get your leg moving. And, um, that, that just doesn't occur anymore. They want you up and walking within hours. And one of the main reasons why I chose my surgery to be at 7.30 in the morning, not only because it was the first surgery, but because you get the benefit of doing a PT session 
that same day. So it's one night in the hospital and then PT starts just a few hours afterwards. So I got to tell you, I was, I was completely pain free at 11 a.m. and I got up and with the physical therapist walking around with a walker, and I said, this is easy. I'm going to work tomorrow. Okay. <laughs> this is nothing. <laughs> so, and I was just absolutely amazed at how quickly you could, you could start walking on this prosthesis. What's the, what's the cement cures to fit that prosthesis in your femur and your tibia? It is essentially indestructible. And so you, they want you up walking to get that swelling down and get the soft tissue mobilizing in it. And I, I was just amazed at how, how quickly you can get up and now you had, you had mentioned that they had done some sort of block. Yes, that's time. right. And so, <laughs> <laughs> so, so did that contribute to your pain-free existence at a lot of Absolutely. Of Absolutely. <laughs> and, okay. you know, I completely, I completely forgot about that afterwards. I'm like, oh, I'm moving around, no problem, <laughs> right? And so, so, you know, by the next morning, I, I still was pain-free and I'm like, wow, I expected the block not to last this long. But a couple days later, the block goes away. Your left wind kind of what is seen on the left side. So you could just see the tremendous amount of bruising and swelling from this. And uh, so that's what it looked like. Uh, I think about post operative day number three. And so the pain just dramatically gets worse from there. Okay. And the swelling gets dramatically worse. Um, so I, I basically was sitting on the couch, getting up, walking around every couple hours. This is my dog, Hawk. So he was a good recovery for me. A um, little bit about the, the rehab. So the rehab um, starts and um, they actually uh, send a therapist out to your house a couple days a week um, before you start driving and moving around. And that was just fantastic. I mean, this therapist would come over in the morning um, and do a PT session for about 45 minutes. And, you know, I, I thought this was going to be a big vacation for me, but it was hundred percent work for essentially two months because you have to do really two to two PT sessions a day. And the key is getting the end range, range of motion, both with flexion and extension. For me, the extension was the biggest issue. I, I could not fully extend my leg, um, for probably close to about 10 years. I had probably about a, a two degree flexion contracture. Um, because the end surface of extension was, was being impeded by the, the arthritis. And so, so if you think about that, what happens is your, your gastrocnemius muscle, your calf muscle and your hamstring muscles, they tighten up and they shorten over those years. And so not only is it tough to try to get the joint out to length, but stretching out those muscles that are tight. And when you're a, when you're a thick, fat Italian guy like me with big muscles in your legs, that's a much harder scenario to do than if you're 90 years old with no muscle mass. So, you know, younger patients tend to do a, a bit worse when it comes to range of motion than, than older patients do. So that, that was kind of a surprise. Um, so um, let's go here. So, um, so as far as getting back to like what a full-time job this is, um, you know, I, I would get up in the morning and do an hour of PT and then I'd ice for another hour. And then like by that time, it's 11 o'clock in the morning and I'm just completely wiped out. You got to take a nap for an hour or so. And then by the time you sort of settle in, get something to eat, and then you do the, the afternoon session by about three or four in the afternoon. And, and then it, the whole process starts over again. And then the first four, four weeks or so it was very difficult to get comfortable at night and sleep. So you're on some narcotic medication, some anti-inflammatories and, and, you know, you're just kind of can't sleep at night. And then the next morning you're just wiped out. So it is a massive process to get through. I, I would say I was on some, some narcotic medication, um, mostly off of it during the day at about the fourth day after surgery, but I still needed it at night for a good couple of weeks just to, to get comfortable. Um, so, you know, really I, I was, I, I was sort of, uh, not prepared for this all that well you know, based on my experience in the hospital, which was so good. Does this uh, lend insight into your own patient's recoveries? Because they always say that, you know, being a patient yourself makes you understand your own patients. Best. Oh, no question. And I think, you know, I, I've, I've undergone some major surgeries throughout my lifetime. I've had 
you know, these, the, the few ACLs and meniscus tears were not easy either. And so, you know, I, I have a very good understanding post-operably. So I, and this only reinforced it for me, for myself and my patients, just because I, I kind of know what they're going through. And, you know, the types of surgeries we do, there's a gradient of pain. So like breast reconstruction in general is very painful. Um, facial surgery oftentimes is not usually as painful as breast surgery. So I, I really tried to taper my expectations of patients post-operative recovery. And, but there's a balance between, you know, using medication and kind of doing other things to help with, uh, with the pain control. I would say that uh, I had a very good understanding of alternative methods for pain control, such as ice. Ice is key, exceptionally important. I had an ice cooler in my bathroom. I would buy, you know, bags of ice every two days and constantly, constantly keep ice on this thing. And I think that was a huge, huge step in recovery. And so, you know, it's the same thing I tell patients is ice is really kind of the main thing to help you with pain control, reduces inflammation, uh, reduces the inflammatory mediators. It's just a key concept for post-operative control in any surgery. Um, so I'm happy to report that I did not necessarily require a walker very long after surgery. So normally I think, you know, what my therapist was telling me is it's about two to three weeks that people are on, patients are on walkers. And I was able to transition to a cane very quickly within the first week. So I had a lot of residual strength. I, I spent a lot of time prior to surgery trying to get range of motion and strength before sort of prehabilitation, if you will, um, as opposed to uh, post -re rehabilitation and was able to use a cane pretty quickly afterwards. And, you know, these are, I, the good news is a couple buddies of mine actually bought me these canes and I, I thought these were awesome. So the one on the right is a, is a shark, which I thought was very, very uh, fitting for some of my hobbies. And then the one on the left is, is you guys recognize this? Uh, that's, a, that, that's a dire wolf. Exactly. So I call this my, so I call this yes. my cane of thrones. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> <laughs> These are kind of fun. So, yeah. Really yeah. Um, so this is my post-operative uh, uh, view of my x-ray. So for my first post-operative visit. And, you know, you could see just the extent of what's replaced here. So, um, you know, this, uh, this prosthesis fits like a cap right on top of the femur. and fits like a kind of a nail or a plug into the, into the uh, tibia. And, you know, the thing that that uh, surprised me about this when I kind of looked into it was, you know, I sort of had this vision that the entire joint end of the joint was amputated, but it, that's actually not how it's done. It's, it's just the articular surface that's removed. And so that leaves you a lot of good bony stock left behind. So if you ever needed a revision, you can, you know, that you have the bone there to do it. Um, the good news with this is it, it gained me about a half a centimeter of height. So now, um, now I'm actually a little bit taller than it was beforehand. So that's, uh, that's a good thing. <laughs> so yeah, you look yeah. straight. Yeah. And so, so if you look at these here, these, these photographs, so this was on the left, this was before and on the right, this is after. And what I wanted to show you here is just the, the angle of the axis of this bone here. So you can see here, uh, on the preoperative picture, you know, that's a, that's a good five degrees of varus, five to seven degrees of varus, which is a huge, huge deformity. And then afterwards, it's essentially straight within about one to two degrees of varus. So the important thing is, um, you know, the surgeon will sort of dial in the amount of varus based on your, on your existing uh, genetics, right? So um, the, um, you know, you don't want to be exactly 100% straight because the opposite side is still in varus deformity. And so, um, so it, he accounted for that. And, you know, my knee feels very symmetric when I'm kind of doing my exercises now. I feel a little bit more stable. I don't feel like I'm kind of shifting or listing over to the side. So pretty, pretty fascinating. What, what an interesting. No, it was in the last line. And so. <laughs> So, so, you know, so those of you that are uh, a little older, like myself and, and these two guys, you know, you may remember this, uh, this uh, uh, series from the 70s or 80s. It's uh, the $6 million man. So this was Steve Austin 
Lee Majors, right? Lee Majors. Steve Austin, who uh, had all of his essential joints replaced and kind of became a superhuman. So I, I'm not exactly the $6 million man, but this is a this is a copy of my bill, okay? I'm about the $110,000 man. So you can just see here, and, and <laughs> this was just one joint. So if I had my total body replaced, I'd probably be close to, what I calculated, I'd probably be close to about $10 million to account for inflation. Um, and so, you know, this is, this is just an exceptional cost, obviously, for patients, uh, if you're paying out of pocket. And, you know, if you look at the surgery, surgical services here, so $57,000 for the, for the prosthesis, uh, actually, no, that's not true, um, uh, supplies. So $30,000 for the prosthesis, that's, that's an exceptional cost. But if you think about, you know, what that means for someone's life and someone's uh, longevity, you know, that's a, that's a fraction of the cost of someone's earning potential. If you cannot work or you cannot provide for your family because of arthritis, um, you know, that's, that, that's, you know, you can add a few zeros to there and lost potential income or lost support for, for someone. So this is, you know, this is a huge advance in medicine, uh, that we, that we've, uh, we've had throughout the year. You know, so I'd, I'd like to actually call you the fourteen thousand one hundred dollar. I'm not even giving you one hundred and ten. That were ninety five thousand dollars in write offs right there. So, um, so you know, but still yeah. impressive. So, <laughs> you know, so uh, yeah. well, let me ask you one question because um, I mean it's interesting. Um, I mean, just fascinating how bad the disease was you were living with. And you talked about the pain, you didn't dwell on the pain, but it's clearly a very painful recovery that's going on. And you've been through painful operations before, but out of this most recent operation you have, which is by far and away the biggest one you've had, like what, what new perspective do you have when dealing with your own patients? Are you prescribing medications differently? Are you, people are complaining about, because the surgeons sometimes will have patients that want to be on right. pain meds forever. How are, how are you doing things differently as a result of it? Well, I would say, you know, I was always very in tune to patients' pain and discomfort. You know, I, I would say that on the bell curve of things, I, I personally, as a physician, had a bit of a challenge dealing with that subgroup of patients on the bell curve that may have had challenges getting off of pain. Maybe, maybe the pain is, is uh, extensive. Maybe there's some underlying factors that are at, at course here. So... I think my experience now has really helped me a little bit more with that sort of subgroup of patients that may have difficulty getting off their patients. And, you know, I'm a big proponent of sort of uh, alternative methodologies of, of pain control. So, for example, um, I mentioned, obviously, the ice, um, the elevation, uh, acupuncture. I haven't personally tried, but I've heard great things about it. Um, for years with our breast cancer reconstructed patients or breast cancer patients, you know, I've, I've advocated for um, utilizing um, THC or, or CBD, um, you know, that's real big in California. And I'm, I, I'm a big believer that is, that's, a, that's a great methodology as an adjunct for control that we haven't really grasped onto it, grasped onto or, or believed in as providers. And I think that's... The, the ability of the of providers to kind of utilize that in the regimen is one small piece. And I think that's huge. I, I personally hadn't used, I did not use any THC or CBD. No, well, that's not true. Um, I did use CBD, but not THC during my joint recovery. And honestly, I'm a big believer in CBD. I think it really helps tremendously. It helped me sleep at night a bit. There's no sort of high component to it at all. Um, the CBD is you know, legal in most states, I think. And I, I think it's, you know, it's, it's not a necessarily regulated medication, but I think if you, if you stick with recommendations and the purity, it can be very helpful. Um, and so, so those things I think are very important um, for patients to kind of, you know, do a multimodal approach to pain control. I think one of the biggest things we have as doctors is is that hard, it's hard for us to give up trust and control to another physician because we have been on that side. We've been in control. And I see time and time again, when you have to give yourself up and put yourself in someone else's hands, you know, 
you, you have to do it. You have to go, you, we know you have to go all in and fully trust your provider. That's the only way you're going to get a good outcome most of the time is fully trust that provider. But that, but that's a hard thing to do. It is, it is. And, you know, I will say that uh, in times in my, what's, what's made this process easy for me is being a surgeon, knowing the reputation of the surgeons and anesthesiologists I work with, I, I sort of just completely gave into the process, you know, and because it was very easy for me because I personally know these people, right? Now, if I had a medical problem that didn't require surgery, I, I'm not a, an internist or a medical physician. It's a lot more difficult for me, even with my children, you know, my, my children's have medical issues to put my trust in a pediatrician or an internist that I don't necessarily know. Um, and, and that's something I have to learn and deal with as a parent and as a, as a human. Um, but in surgery, it was really easy for me because Bill has an exceptional reputation. I know he's, he thinks through things. He's going to do the right thing. He's got thousands and thousands of reps of doing this operation. And, and that, to me, that was a tremendous amount of comfort. So when I have these kind of little spikes after surgery of, oh my God, I feel this ache and pain here. Is this the prosthesis failing? You know, I, I had to kind of grasp and stop myself from that and say, well, you know, this can't possibly happen. Let's just kind of wait till my appointment and not freak out about it. You know, and it's, it's really easy as a physician to freak out about things. Yeah. And just, just a little bit about kind of the recovery now where I'm at, um, you know, so I'm about four months in and, you know, I'm back to working full time. I'm back at the gym. I, uh, doing Stairmaster, I'm doing biking, I'm doing incline walking. I haven't kind of ran or jogged yet. I don't plan on doing that to any extent. Um, the more you sort of do a lot of higher impact sports that can affect the, the length of the prosthesis, it's not, it's not prohibited. Um, so I do plan to kind of go back to a little bit of refereeing if I can. Um, I actually was surfing this morning and, uh, you know, it, it was, little questionable as to my strength, but you know, in the next few months, I think that'll get better, but I was able to stand up and kind of get, you know, a few waves this morning. So I was, I was pretty excited about that. So back to, back to everything for the most part. That's amazing. Well, Sal, thank you so much for sharing that with us. It's, um, it's definitely nothing that Sam and I have been through, um, such an extensive operation patient and so perspective and what we have to look forward to over the next uh, few decades of our lives. Thank you so much, Tom. <laughs> All right. Thanks. Appreciate it.